Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's Learning Space. Uh, I'm Nicole Gallucci, postdoc with CosmoQuest. Uh, thank you guys for joining us this week. We are going to be talking about the intersection of art and science uh, with the good people from Mad Art Lab. Uh, before we jump into that, I want to go over the basics of commenting. Um, I, we seem to have lost the ability to add a Twitter hashtag. Sorry, guys. Um, but you can comment over on the uh, on the YouTube page where this is playing, or on the event page for CosmoQuest where this is playing, or on Google Plus. Uh, uh, pretty much anywhere else it's being streamed, I should be picking up those comments as well. So feel free to say hi, ask questions as we go, um, and let's get right into it. So I am joined by some of the fabulous bloggers from Mad Art Lab, MadArtLab.com. We'll put the links as you go on the event page comments uh, and in the show notes afterwards. Uh, so why don't we get an introduction from uh, Amy? Take it away. Hey, Nicole. Say your last name again, because I think I have been saying it wrong for like 15 years. You and everybody else, man. Uh, I, I, I say Gallucci. That is Gallucci. a somewhat Americanized version of Gulucci. Yeah, you've been Gulucci so, to me right. for years now. See, I've yeah. already learned something today. <laughs> so anyway, hey everyone. Some of you may recognize me because I was just on a hangoutathon with That's people right. <laughs> uh, about a week ago, and I shared a whole lot of information about my art. And I may have mentioned that I am the managing editor of a website called Mad Art Lab, and that website is about the intersection between art, science, skepticism, and geek culture. And so I thought it would be really fun since you've learned about my art already, for me to bring on some of the fantastic contributors to that website. So that they can sort of share with you how art and science can work together to spread information and how they also sort of break down the stereotypes about how artists are not that bright and how science is super rigid. So I brought some people <laughs> on to show you that that's just not true at all that science and art can work together really well and I think need to work together moving into the future so that we can sort of help our culture along with some of the more difficult concepts in science. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sort of jump on over to some of my contributors and let them introduce themselves so you can find out how awesome they are. So I'm going to start with Anne. Hi. Yeah, and, oh, and I should yeah. say, tell everyone what you do, what type of art you create, and what you contribute to Mad Art Lab. Go ahead, Anne. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Um, hi, everyone. So, again, my name's Anne Sauer, um, and as you can see from my little title, my focus on Mad Art Lab is food. Um, so I, you know, I come uh, to the blog with um, a you know, passion for cooking and eating, um, and also for making cocktails and sodas and other delicious beverages. Um, which I've done some professionally um, and a lot just at home. Um, and I, I don't know that I, that I would say that I've always approached um, cooking from a scientific perspective, but I find it really interesting to look into uh, why it is um, we cook things the way we do, what, the, you know, what techniques work and why, um, what it means for our taste buds, how different foods affect us, uh, stuff like that. So that's um, the main focus of what I write about on the website. Oh, Ashley, take it away. Sure. Um, I am Ashley Hamer, and I am the resident musician. I believe there isn't another one um, on, the, on the blog. And um, basically, yeah, I write about music a lot. I really like to write about maybe the, the neuroscience of music. Um, there have been a lot of studies lately about what happens to your brain when you're listening to music, what, um, how, how pianists learn to play a melody better, um, like after a night of sleep. Um, and then there are also a whole lot of really interesting things involving like data collection and turning that into melodies and things like that. And that's, yeah, that's the kind of stuff I like to write about on that art lab. Pretty much it. Thanks, Ashley. Brian, what about you? What do you do, my friend? Oh, boy. Hi. We've been asking this question for months. <laughs> no one can figure well, it, it says, out. It says uh, in the title now. Oh, yeah. oh it does? I He's put it down there. Um, okay. Raw -er. Okay. That works. <laughs> I gave Brian. you that title, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm Brian George, and uh, I'm an illustrator, one of the uh, visual artists at Mad Art Lab. Um, I like to tackle all sorts of different things there, and uh, in a lot of ways, one of my favorite things to do is uh, how art can aid science and vice versa, and how um, 
oh, I don't know, like how people get influenced and from a young age uh, seeing how science can be portrayed visually and, um, you know, that's one of my favorite things to talk about. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Okay, and now Ryan. We're going to do a little poem with Brian and Ryan later. <laughs> um, I guess I'm... I'm the resident engineer and scientist, I guess, on Mad Art Lab. I came from the other end. Uh, I actually found myself on Mad Art Lab becoming more of an artist, and I fill every gap that I stumble into, um, just realizing I accidentally ended up on an art blog, and I keep trying to make new art and trying to and finding out how my science can help me make art, and how now that I've made art, I can use that to teach science. And it's just been this bizarre spiral. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So you guys all brought projects to share Yay. with the audience today, as far as I know. Is that, mm -hmm. Does anyone want to volunteer to go first and talk about their projects? Well, I wanted I mean, to... Everyone, pr everyone pretty much knows what I do already. I make Surly Ramics, and oh, I... This is the first one I got. Oh, that is uh, like vintage right there. This is my first one, too. Oh, oh. I'm not wearing awesome. my first one, but I'm wearing my Jupiter and Four Moons, which oh, is my current favorite. Sweet. I did not so. force them all to wear those and tell them that they were going to be fired from the blog if they didn't, I swear. Uh, you can't fire me! <laughs> well, not from that blog, from the other ones. Great <laughs> I'll get you fired from Sketch. Yeah. I would never do that. But, uh, yeah, so I make uh, jewelry that's basically influenced by science, and I'm, you know, constantly uh, inspired by all the fantastic people that I meet and the concepts. And the, Like I talked about last time when I was on... Uh, the Cosmo Quest Hangout. Nicole and all the other Cosmo Quest people have been a huge inspiration in my life and really gave me lots of things to learn about. And I sort of translate that into my art. So I'll find something that I'm interested in, and then I will, you know, delve into it and I try to find more about it. Like Supermoon just happened, you guys, right? Isn't yeah. it awesome? Like that no, means that the moon thunder. is bigger, <laughs> right? No, that's not right, Nicole. You gotta tell me I'm wrong. Um, I had a thunderstorm anyway, so, oh. yeah, no, I actually, somebody asked us to do a viewing, and it's like, well, there's, it's not, eh, it's visually not going to be any different, uh, but then we had a thunderstorm anyway, so that, 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 uh, kind of killed Sorry. it for me. We, we could see it here in California where there's never thunderstorms, so <laughs> we busted out our little telescope, and then we took photos with our iPhone through the telescope, which nice. is sort of another example of you know, what a lucky time that we live in right now and how we can make art and learn about things. So imagine what Galileo would have felt like if he could take photos like that Seriously. in his backyard. So we live in a really amazing time. But that sort of gives you an overview of uh, the kind of art that I do. So I find something that interests me. And like Supermoon just happened, I made a bunch of necklaces over the past couple days with the moon on them. Just sort of, you know, it's my way of sort of expressing my awe and fascination with science that's happening around me. So hopefully now we can hear a little bit more from the people that I brought along. So who wants to volunteer to talk about it? <laughs> hmm? Do you want me to call on someone? And <laughs> you're right next to me in the little yeah. room. Alphabetically. <laughs> that's fine. Okay, um, tell us what you do. Well, I mean, the the thing that I wanted to talk about first, because I can get into some of the, the food stuff, because I have a few things on the back burner. Um, but I wanted I wanted to share something that I actually just put a post up about today, which is my tattoo Yay. that I got oh, a couple of months on. ago. And, like, what? Literally, are they on your stove? Are you going to be eating them for us? Or <laughs> you them for this us? isn't. And Ryan might be referring to um, we as Mad Art Lavers sometimes get together and have hangouts, and they're usually during the time of evening when I'm cooking dinner, so people get to watch me cook. But nice. no, good catch. They're not literally on my back burner. <laughs> it's hard for me to get up from where I am to go into the kitchen. Um, no, but a couple months ago, um, I got a tattoo, which has actually been in the works for um, almost a year now. Um, Brian, who's here actually designed it for me um, from the idea that I had, but I thought you guys, uh, CosmoCast viewers, would appreciate it. Um, I've got the image on my computer to share, too. Oh, okay. oh she's got it up there. I have, this um, is from the blog, but I also have the image. Yeah. I want to see the and I can thing, show you. So cool. Um, Nicole, if you jump back to my screen, I can show, like, I can try to show what it is on, where it yeah, is on my yeah, yeah, yeah. body. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. So that, that's it's where hard, it is, hard, and here's the actual there. picture. So but, yeah. Can, yeah, yeah, so they can see the picture now. Whoops. So what it, um, where this came from um, was 
um, a quote from Carl Sagan, um, and Amy's made jewelry based on this quote as well, too, and another one of our uh, bloggers has a different tattoo, um, but it's the uh, We Are All Made of Star Stuff quote from Carl Sagan, um, which I, I found particularly inspiring, um, especially the, the line that comes after it, um, which is that we are all made of star stuff, we are a way for the cosmos to know itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people like to say, you know, I'm an atheist, uh, a lot of us here are, if not all of us, um, <laughs> right now, and for me that sort of um, uh, represents how I connect myself to the, the greater um, plane of existence that I'm a part of. Um, and so I had this idea as I was falling asleep, very clear of like, oh, I want this tattoo that, that shows how like if you peel the skin back, we're literally made of stars and galaxies. So that's kind of what's going on in this image. Um, and Brian was able to do a, a design um, that really took it out of my head and um, brought it into the world. And I found an artist who did an amazing job. So that post is up today. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for letting me share. Um, it's actually been, um, like besides a way to, for me to feel connected, been a really um, interesting conversation starter uh, because people see it and they've never seen any like tattoo quite like it. Usually they're not really sure what's going on with it at first. Um, but I get to point out to them, oh yeah, it's a quote from Carl Sagan and uh, this is what he did and isn't this cool? And I get to find out how many people um, he has really influenced and touched. Um, and it's been a great way to start conversations and make connections with new people. So. I love that's it. really cool. So Brian, that's, oh, that's great. Brian is the person to talk to. Yeah. Designing <laughs> tattoos, because I've had ideas floating. I wanted to celebrate getting my PhD with a tattoo, but that's been a while now. So oh, you should just get doctor that. really huge across your ah. back and like prison letters <laughs> piled higher and deeper. Oh, I, I, I wanted to be radio astronomy. Oh, that's great. Ooh. Okay. Yeah, we can talk about that. I'm in the process. The more tattoos I design, the more people want me to design tattoos. So it's been fun. Uh, Self doing fulfilling. That. I, yeah. <laughs> I just got um, my own second tattoo that I designed, my art and science tattoo uh, recently, too. So nice. that's been a nice little advertisement as well. Yes. <laughs> show us. It's not on your butt, is it? Show us. <laughs> oh, okay. I can show you. It's right here. Can you see it? Oh, yeah. <gasps> oh, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That was awesome. Thanks. Wow. Thin line. We have a it's friend. It's so uh, very bland right now. <laughs> no. You feel bland, Ryan? Oh, yeah. I, I don't have any ink. All of, oh, like, all of the marks on my bad. skin are accidental. <laughs> There's something to be said for that, though. <laughs> <laughs> Tells the story of your life. Yeah. Um, Battle scars. Yeah. <laughs> Carved in clumsiness. And I, I also wanted to mention that you uh, designed a drink for us for a previous Learning Space Hangout where we talked to the uh, one of the organizers of Yuri's Night. Mm -hmm. We were talking about uh, getting to, you know, having a Yuri's Night cocktail. I think this is probably also partly Ryan's fault <laughs> for getting you involved. But there's this great... Um, uh, recipe you came up with for Vostok fuel, like cocktail for Yuri's Nights. Oh, yeah. uh, unfortunately, yeah. the bar I was at was not quite as skilled at all the, you know, we, we ended up drinking white Russians, but I, I will... No, un unfortunately, it's not really a recipe that you can just, like, ask for anywhere yeah. or whip up. Um, and, and while there's a way to make it that, that anyone can do at home, mm -hmm. obviously I'm using some equipment that's a little bit specialized to make right. it. Um, right. But the name Vostok fuel is a, obviously, a, it was a play on Moscow Mule, which is oh. a vo vodka, lemon, and ginger beer drink. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. So that's what this was based on, but I took the vodka and infused it with tarragon. Yeah, um, this sounds so which cool. Which you can find in Russian cooking, and then used a technique called uh, nitrogen cavitation mm -hmm. to infuse that. So you can make an infusion of a spirit um, just by putting whatever it is you want to flavor your spirit with in a jar with it and like shaking it up and letting it sit for a week or two or three. Right. Um, but... Uh, there's a quick way to do it um, that they've been using in um, in professional kitchens, sort of molecular gastronomy style. Um, so nitrogen cavitation, where you actually take a, a whipped cream canister. Um, I'm I'm not in my kitchen right now, so I can't grab it. But mm -hmm. um, the type of thing that you use uh, nitrous oxide to aerate cream, but you can use that just to pressurize the canister. Um, and whatever's inside it, that pressure sort of breaks open the cell walls of the plants or the herbs or whatever's in there. Um, 
and then extracts those flavors out into the surrounding liquid very quickly. So what would normally take a few weeks to infuse, you can do in a couple minutes using that pressure. Um, so that's a fun way, like we, the group that I worked with did this, used this technique to make instant gin at some parties um, where, you know, gin starts out very much like vodka, unflavored, um, but you add delicious things to it, redistill it, uh, juniper berries specifically, and then other things like orange peel, rosemary. Um, anyway, we, we, had, we would go to a party, we'd start with vodka, we'd have a selection of different um, botanicals is what they're called, including juniper berries, but also rose peels, hops, flowers, different things like that, and people could pick two or three and add them and then we'd make them their own custom gin flavor and then make a cocktail for them. That's a pretty like, cool thing to be able to do. Ooh, wow, that's um, really cool. You can I'm, use I'm this pickles. device. Yeah. Can, you, can I do that with my pickles that I just put on the counter? Can I explode my pickles into being um, pickles? If you, put, <laughs> if you put pickles and some like liquid and stuff into one of these, you could, in fact, flavor the pickles. People have used it to like marinate, like to like infuse meat, too, I think. I've never tried that. Um, but you can use it to whip egg whites the same way that you would um, whip whipped cream. Um, and we've done that for some egg white cocktails that normally you'd have to shake for a really yeah. long time to whip yeah, up yeah, that yeah. egg white. Instead, we can combine that with a little sugar and stuff and um, do the egg white topping on a cocktail instead oh, of shaking cool. it. Oh, that's cool. I'm a brand new Pisco Sour yeah. convert, so uh -huh. yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I need to learn that. That would be a good use. <laughs> Very cool. I don't even know what that is. What is Pisco yeah. Sour? Tell, tell us. And you. Okay. All I right. discovered it because so I was chilly for a week. So, you haven't noticed. Okay, the rest of so, so one, of, one, of the things, one of the things that I've been lucky enough to get to do um, is actually present at the California Academy of Sciences nightlife event, which is um, there Thursday, every Thursday night from 6 to 10 p.m. It's open late for adults only, and they sell alcohol, but they also have a bunch of um, demos going on and people doing talks, and it's always on a theme. Um, and I've done maybe four or five um, talks during this event now. Um, like I like feel really honored as a non-scientist to be able to go and like teach people about something at it, you know a really amazing institution in my city. Um, this is the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. Um, but one of the first talks I did was on Pisco, um, and we used that technique to make Pisco punch. Um, but also talked about the history of Pisco. It's a so spirits are distilled from. Oh, how how far do we want to go into this? Uh, <laughs> Science. So, yeah. Okay. So you so so wine is made from fermented grapes, right? Beer is made from fermented grains. Um, if you take, like, basically what is beer, like this mash of grain and liquid, and you distill it, where's a process where it's heated up, and the alcohol evaporates at a different rate than the water, so you can separate that off. That's how you get uh, whiskey. Um, so like bourbon is mostly corn, rye is mostly rye. Um, scotch is uh, delicious. Oh, barley. <laughs> yes. So yeah. So sake is rice. So, P so pisco. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> pisco is made from um, is made by distilling wine. Essentially, it's a grape based spirit, mm -hmm. oh. um, and it is popular in Peru. Mm -hmm. um, I was in Chile. Yes, for, and Chile. Uh, yeah, so that's where the astronomers were all like, you have to have Pisco Sour. <laughs> yeah, so the Pisco Sour is... But not before you is... go to 16,000 feet. <laughs> yeah, Pisco <laughs> Sour is Pisco and uh, citrus, lemon, lime, simple oh. syrup, um, usually an egg white yeah. as well. Actually, always an egg white in that one. Sours um, traditionally have egg whites. And a little bit of bitters on top. Um, and I'm going to be talking a lot about bitters at Convergence at Ooh, Skepticon, yes. which is an event coming up that we can talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, but where was I going with this? Last year at Convergence, yeah. oh, you yeah, did a really cool Sour is actually display. the official yeah. drink, official drink of Peru, like national. Like but you have to drink Chile it. Chile and Peru <laughs> yeah. are they in fight arguments over who owns people. it. Yes, yeah. and who owns it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that I do know. But, but it was very course... popular in this in the city where I live in San Francisco. Um, mm -hmm. the, the traders would come by with it like on the routes other places. Um, and so the Pisco Punch was actually invented here, which is another... Pisco yeah. drink. Um, so yeah. Cool. I'm thirsty so now. Last yeah. year at Convergence, Anne did a really cool display where she had drinks that glowed in the dark. Are you going to be doing a similar type of display this year, or are you going to be doing something with, what did you say about bitters? What are you going to do? Yeah. Um, so our, uh, for those who don't know, Convergence is a, um, is a science fiction and fantasy convention held in Minneapolis over the 4th of July weekend every year. And Skeptic and, uh, and all of our sister sites 
do a track of science panels at the Sci-Fi and Fantasy Con. Um, it's really great um, because we're getting people who aren't already necessarily a part of our community exposed to science and scientific thinking. Um, and it's also a blast. <laughs> um, and everyone dresses in costumes, and it's a really great weekend. Um, and we also throw parties uh, every evening. Um, and this year our party theme is, what is it, Circus Sideshow? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to go a little, a little old-timey, like, snake oil salesman sort of thing. Bitters were um, originally created as medicines. Um, they're made from um, a classification of, of plants called bitters, um, different herbs and spices, and they were sort of um, hailed as these fantastic cure-alls, everything from indigestion to headache to impotence to incontinence to jaundice, you know, like, and of course, um, anything that claims to be able to cure all of those things, which all have different causes and affect different bodily systems, like, there's just no way that that, that can be true. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the role that bitters play in a cocktail as a balancing agent, but also how we can see, you know, now we know, oh, it's ridiculous to think that, that this ingredient we use in cocktails is a medicine, but there are other things out there that people are claiming are medicinal um, or that have effects on our bodies but are not regulated and we do not really know what kinds of effects they have, um, that we should bring the same kind of skepticism to those types of products as we now do to things like bitters. Um, and I have friends who make these really beautiful etched bottles, um, and they're going to make some really cool props for me. And I'm going to do a cocktail that's, I think it's going to be bitters and green tea based. So it's a little bit of, of delicious snake oil. Um, I'm still so working on those plans, but that's, yeah. uh, that's <laughs> so really these guys so haven't, heard, haven't heard that yet. So. That's um, so great. So we have a question from Guido Bibra, um, who uh, is suggesting, uh, can there be a Yuri's Night tea blend for non for non alcohol drinkers? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if that's definitely. It. Let me um, let me give me a little bit of time. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And I'll come you up with an, an alternate <laughs> one for uh, for all you non drinkers out there. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Or maybe something that will infuse the the colas that some of us are addicted to. <laughs> I don't know what would happen if you put a carbonated beverage in, but I have soda water, so maybe I'll find out later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, do we want to go down? Does anyone else want to volunteer, or do we want to go down the line? I just want to point out that that was a really great example of how uh, we can overlap science and art, and just Anne's enthusiasm is sort of something that we like to showcase on Mad Art Lab. Even if you don't have a degree in the sciences, but you want to get involved as an artist or, you know, just as a citizen scientist, you, yeah. you can. And what she just sort of explained with giving the talks about drinks at, you know, science institutions is a really great example. And it was just perfect. So thank you for that, Anne. And Ashley, do you want to go next? Do you want to talk a little bit about music and maybe sure. music in space, something like that? Sure, yes. Okay. Oh, man. The stuff that you were saying, by the way. Quiet. Yeah, oh, Ashley got quiet. Am I quiet? Oh, just I wasn't talking. You mean? <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, yeah we're not audio levels are okay. It's true. I talk a lot, but now they're actually an audience, and I don't want to say oh. the stupid stuff I always say. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'll be like academic and official. Mm. Um, but no, what Amy, what you are saying? <laughs> you have a pony. Awesome. We're, we're not very official here. Okay. Well, I should. <laughs> well, I will. I'll show my cat at some point then. So that's what I'll do. But anyway, no, Amy, what Amy was saying is, is totally true. Like, I was really looking for a way to, like, I, I um, as, a, as a musician, I never really felt like I had anything to say about skepticism or science. And Mad Art Lab has totally opened that up. Like, I feel like I actually have, like, a voice in this community now, which is so awesome. Um, but anyway, yeah, I was going to talk about, since this is sort of a spacey podcast, um, the... The amount of music that's going on in outer space, or and and there's also some music that's being planned to go on. Like I know that um, Sarah Brightman, the opera singer, yeah, if right. you know her, mm -hmm. um, she has actually like worked it out with Russia to go up on a Soyuz um, spacecraft. In I think it's 2015, she's going up. Um, they. She, she paid about, like, 50 million to go up there. And she's planning on um, singing a piece. She's just come out with an album that's all, like, about humans' interaction with the stars, um, with, like, actually all uh, pieces that have already been composed, but 
that, that kind of speak to her in that way. And I believe she's going to be singing some of those songs in space with an orchestra um, on the ground, which is going to be pretty interesting because there's a really long delay. Um, yeah. Nicole, you probably know better than me, like nine I, seconds or something. Yeah, 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 depending on what <laughs> they're using for that. Yeah, I suppose. So I feel like what they're going to have to do, I'm sorry, I have a cat. Um, <laughs> Never apologize for that. <laughs> but um, what I'm gonna, what what I think they're gonna have to do is she's just gonna have to go ahead and sing and not listen to what the orchestra is doing, yes. and then have the composer, I mean the the conductor, just kind of play along with what she's doing, sort of like they do when they're um, when they're recording like movie soundtracks. The movie will be up in the back, and the and the conductor will be watching exactly what's happening when, and then they'll, you know, that, that cue will happen right when someone opens the door or whatever. I feel like that's probably what they're going to have to do, which kind sense. of sucks because it's not actually going to be a real live performance, but I think that's as close as they're going to get. As close as live, yeah, close to live as you're going to get from the space station. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, Muse is another band that's uh, been talking a lot about going up to space. Mm -hmm. And they have crap loads of money, so I'm sure they'll do it eventually. Mm -hmm. And that will actually be a live performance because like, they'll go up together um, and they'll all play together. Um, but the person who's been actually doing live music from space has been Chris Hadfield. Yeah. Everybody loves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's like everyone's hero. He, loves him. he is. Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, he he recently, I'm sure everyone knows this already, but he performed with um, Ed Ed Robertson, the Bare Naked Ladies frontman. Mm -hmm. uh, also, also, oh, I didn't realize he was also Canadian. That's pretty awesome. The bare um, Naked Ladies? You guys didn't know the Bare Naked Ladies? I don't know. Canadian? I just assume everyone's American unless they're from <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> oh. I should oh. know. Right. I'm Canadian. Ryan, don't cry. What? You are what? <laughs> Um, like no, twenty percent of our blog is Canadian. You know? it's fine. <laughs> it's true. I was that was a mean joke. I know I know who the Canadians are. It's I just fine. Didn't know who it's fine. Are. We have we have Fraser Kane and we pick on him constantly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he performed with uh, with Ed Robertson um, from space, and Ed was on the ground, and they actually composed their, that tune together. Mm -hmm. um, there are some cool videos of that too, where they're 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 talking about what the lyrics are going to be and how it's going to go. And uh, there's a children's choir and everything, but that one, I I think that was even less than live. If you watch the video, it really looks like um, they, I haven't actually found proof of any of this, but mm -hmm. uh, it looks like Chris Robertson. I mean, Chris Chris Hadfield just recorded himself playing, and then sent it, and then they just played it, and everyone else played along with the recording. Okay. Um, which you know, I don't know. I'm I'm asking too much. It's space. It's yeah. pretty well, awesome. Mm -hmm. and, and he's got a very tight, you know, all the ISS astronauts have very tight schedules, so I can uh, imagine they, they may have had to do that as well. Yeah. And I also bring up the point that, like, the whole problem with the speed of light means there's no such thing as now. Yeah. You I was can't just gonna say play something thing. live from space. Cause... Yeah. Or ever, because you're going to have a delay <laughs> from the stage. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've never seen a live concert. Everything okay. you've seen happened before. <laughs> That's true. There you go. And heard it, yeah. And it you're never even live. seeing yeah. and hearing the concert at the same time. Because the light and the sound are getting to you at different rates. That and you can never really touch anything either, you guys. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The, the Whoa, molecules man. are all like, changing. <laughs> oh my god, like, what's, what, what's me? What's real? You just blew um, my mind, bro. I really don't want to get me started on that. I'll get really quiet and, and curl up in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> So if, if, if Captain, Commander, what was it, Chris? Commander. It Captain, Commander, Commander Chris would have recorded it nine seconds and sent it nine seconds earlier, and they would have started playing nine seconds earlier. Could we somehow work it out so that it actually was live? I don't know. That I mean, that would, yeah, that would be about as close as to live that we could get, I think. Like, they would start yeah. playing nine seconds. No, but then they wouldn't be in sync. Point. It's when the light yeah. gets to you. Yeah. That is now. That That's, that's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but still, like that's that's and and with that definition, that is live. But I don't think that like having a recording, of course, it was like a really well produced broadcast. Like I don't think you yeah. want to have that that you know Skype malfunction or whatever. Like in the middle, I'm sure they're not using Skype, but 
I like to imagine that they are. I don't know. Maybe that's a new experimental yeah, rock that's going to happen. It's like someone's going to like play some sort of heavy metal from space and then mix it with something that's happening on Earth, and it's going to be like the new mashup, and that's going to be oh the music of the future, you guess. This is sounding like Hitchhiker's Guide with Somebody Hot Somebody playing Desiato. on Mars. <laughs> yeah. And someone's singing on Earth. Oh. I like yeah. That Mm, but uh, one thing, I'm sorry. oh no, it's okay. uh, Chris Hadfield is also one of his, the cool things that he's been doing is talking about how just everyday things are different in space. Mm -hmm. um, and he's talked about how playing guitar is, is very different because you don't have like uh, gravity holding your, your hand down to, there's just, it's a completely different uh, muscle movement when you're playing guitar in, in space. So he would like overshoot the, the frets. Um, constantly, and he had to like basically relearn how to play guitar in, in space. And also, there's there are kind of interesting uh, things involving the the regulations that the kind of testing that has to go on before you even bring a guitar in space. Um, there have been a bunch of different that he uh, he's not the first musician in space. There have also been. Um, there was a, a, a flute player, someone who brought a keyboard, a saxophone, a didgeridoo, and a parlor guitar, um, like, you know, years ago. And they, they say that uh, you have to, like, you have to test it for um, electromagnetic radiation, and you have to, like, heat it up to make sure it doesn't give off toxic gases when it gets, like, oh my God, into yeah. extreme temperatures. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty intense. So, like, you have to be really dedicated if you want to play music in space. Yeah. Ryan, I think didgeridoodling in space is your next challenge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's the next illustration we need for Matt. Uh, well, Aww. we've done didgeridoo. So I'm, I'm thinking like unicycling on the space station. Kind of get the loop and try to... Okay, but that'd be I feel like that would be gravity. If you don't have gravity with a unicycle, like, what are You're you doing? You're just paddling just... in the middle yeah. of the well, If, if, if so you get tired. like a loop... And, and you start unicycling around the loop. You can yeah. generate your yeah. own gravity, oh, right? Yes. Oh, cool. yeah. Or, well, fake gravity, but still. Well, yeah. Cool. Well, I can see that. If you're on a track, right? And you're just going yeah. around, around, around. Yeah. Oh, we have a, a comment from Michael Jobin uh, pointing out that there was also a flute d duo uh, a couple years back between NASA astronaut Katie Coleman and Jethro Tull's Ian Anderson. They did a flute oh, duet. Wow. From, oh, like space and space to Earth? That's pretty cool. Um, I mean, I, feel, I don't think Jethro Tull's Ian Anderson has been to space, so. No, I think this was, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not seeing the, the actual details, but, uh, she, yeah, she was, uh, Coleman was on the space station, and they collaborated on a duet. doesn't say whether it was live or not. Ooh, if there's a recording of that anywhere, send so yeah. it into the contact link at Matt, our lab. We'd love yeah. to there you do go. a little write-up about that. That's really yeah. Cool. That could be a lab track. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah actually, does. tell everyone oh, what yeah. you do. Yeah, you do lab so, tracks. Pretty much every Monday we have um, we feature a skeptical or science themed piece of music. Um, usually it's in the lyrics, but every so often there have been tracks that are just instrumental. Like there was a guy who played on a tree and things. Um, but yeah, we, we we feature we feature a science based uh, song every week. And I, um, you know, when I first started doing it, I didn't think I was going to be able to get past a year. But we've been doing it. You know, for what? How long has Matt Outlet been around? Like over two years. Over two years. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of sciencey music out there, which I was really happy about. Yeah. That's fantastic. And more coming every day, so that's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. All right. Fair so Brian, what's up, our yeah. illustrator in residence? How's it going over there? It's going well, Amy. How's it going uh, in sunny, I'm guessing, California? Yeah, it's like 5,000 degrees in my art studio. <laughs> yeah. Literally delirious and melting right now. I'm so sorry. You have a I'm... beautiful studio. You have a Thank beautiful you. studio, though. Thank you. And I love art and science so much that I decided to show up. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's a hot, uh, it's yeah. a hot day in Brooklyn, too, and I wanted to tell you that we're expecting possibly thunderstorms, so oh, if that okay. window behind me turns purple or green... <laughs> we'll warn you. Yeah, just let me know. Uh, we'll just point and laugh. <laughs> you can do that, too. I'm okay with that. Um, so tell so, us, yeah. Ryan, yeah, what do you do on Mad Art Lab, and what, what did do you bring I do? us well, to talk about? I brought something that I'm hoping that any of us or people watching either have or had or have read when they were maybe a kid, uh -huh. it's this book. Oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> That's a yes! Wait, is that the one? 
Oh my god, is that the one where they, they have like artistic representations of aliens on different planets? Yes, also? I didn't remember it until I scrolled down to that picture. Now, yeah, I have or, this I, book. I should say this is copyright National Geographic. This is copyright I, I, National I, I, Geographic. Um, movie, but this is okay. and, and, yeah, okay. So this is fully illustrated. Yeah. And what Ashley was just mentioning about the aliens, <gasps> oh this is my one god. of my favorite things. <laughs> Mine's falling apart, so I'm just going to hold up the sheets. You remember wow. this, don't you? I, wrote, I, I have a story about that. I okay. read those pages. This is, this is like one of my past <laughs> skepticism. When I was little, I read those pages, and, and I was like, oh, there are aliens on other planets, clearly. They're, they're there. They have pictures of them. And so I went along for like a week of my life believing that there were aliens on every single planet in the solar system. And finally, That's so awesome. And like an adult, and they're like, no, no, where, where did you hear that? And, and it's just, you know, because I just believed it. It was in a book. Like, what what was I supposed to do? <laughs> you didn't read I the stories pictures. that went along with the pictures, <laughs> no, did you? No, not really, no. <laughs> that, that's um, the story, that my dad told me that, like, that they were stories, and it was imagined. Yeah. And that, uh, but that's, that's my gateway drug. That so, book is my gateway drug. Totally. This is oh my, my gateway drug also, and that's why oh I wanted God. to bring it up today. Um, this, I wrote this, a post about it. I, oh, I, I, put the link, I put the link there um, in the event page, but also I'm, I could screen share the post. I feel like I can get away with that. So <laughs> that, that, that image is stuck in my mind forever. Yeah, yeah that's Jupiter, yeah. right? That's, oh uh, uh, yeah, Jupiter. <laughs> this one is Jupiter, and then there's Venus and Pluto all the way on the... Uh, over yeah. here. A little skating guys. Yeah. A little skate, a little yeah. yeah. Um, so I have this book. Um, this one, they published it in 1980. That's when this copy is from, which is why it's falling apart. I've had it since uh, I was a little, little kid, I guess. And um, they republished it in 95, so I don't, I don't know. I want them to do it again, though, so badly, um, to republish it. And it's put out by National Geographic, and it's a fully illustrated guide to our universe. It goes through, it begins with mythology and what uh, ancient people, oh, hi, cat, <laughs> and what ancient <laughs> people believe. And um, it sort of goes through, you know, uh, the history of astronomy. Then it goes through each of the planets and what we know about them. And there are charts and, and, uh, and um, you know graphs and like little factual things like like this like if the Saturn you could find a big enough beaker it would float <laughs> and you see all the way down at the bottom over here is uh, Earth and uh, I think uh, Mercury because they're denser than water and they would sink and then how much you would weigh on everything on uh, different planets and things and um, so I had to do a project I was talking to my mom um, the other day because I couldn't figure out how old I was and I think it was fourth grade so it would have been eight years old and I had to make a project that was I built the solar system out of styrofoam crafting uh, spheres and I had this book I guess my parents had this book so my dad had subscribed to uh, National Geographic and I had to make the solar system so I opened to this page and my jaw I, I just remember being so awestruck as a kid sorry it's falling apart but no. it's the whole solar system yeah. beautifully illustrated um, and I made my entire project from this double page spread and I made cool. you know like charts and uh, all the stuff that you had to write to go along with it you know in fourth grade like the earth is the third planet from the sun <laughs> you know like <laughs> but um but this is the first time I got a sense of scale of everything because everything in this book is like um, it shows the scale of everything. So you can see, I'll show hope this one, like the limb of the sun. And then I saw, you know, like, and the earth is just this tiny little thing. And I was completely blown away. Like, and so I just devoured this book, like, so many times. I've gone through it. And it, and it actually goes into um, the Pluto thing is in this book. This is from 1980. And it actually talks about, should Pluto be called a planet? Wow. It's in the book <laughs> from 1980, and it talks about deep space and um, and what would a space station have to be built like if it were to sustain um, you know life on interstellar missions. There's also I didn't hadn't noticed this until I just looked at this book again recently. Uh, that's probably Hubble. <gasps> oh but my gosh, it's definitely existed, Hubble. <laughs> but before it existed, I so think it was just were, called uh... space telescope. The space telescope, but it's got a NASA logo on it yep. in this illustration, and. Um, 
and it, uh, I think I went up and I think I looked it up, and I think they were grinding the lens for Hubble when this book was published, if I'm not mistaken. They were accidentally making the mirror the wrong size. Perfect. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, that. Uh, 1979, maybe? Right. Um, all good. But so this book, like, this is one of those things that sort of clicked in my head as a kid, right? Um, that just, and, and like, not long after, I remember uh, my, my parents got us a small, like, backyard telescope and uh, a little, like, planetarium thing that would, um, you could change the charts on it and it would shine on the ceiling. And, um, and you know, that was what started down the path. And then I started reading popular science books when I got older. And then, you know, within the last five or six years, started reading blogs and meeting all of you fine folk, and I'm sure a lot of you, like, who are watching and everything. And, uh, like I look at this book as sort of like my gateway and like this is where I oh like really learn to love science and the fact that I've always wanted to be an artist like it's the only thing I can ever remember wanting to be since I was ever and the fact that this book is fully illustrated um, with ideas that are hard to convey just by writing it out or something that you know be difficult to visualize just um, that it's all so well put in this book. And this is the best part of the whole book, in my opinion. It's an entire page of illustration credits. Oh, credits. Wow. A whole page. Yay. Telling <laughs> who did what. And then there's like a lot of famous names that you'd probably recognize, like, um, what's his name? Uh, Chesley Bonestell is a really famous space artist. Um, and, uh, I mean... This is what gets me going, and like, uh, you know, I, I my my folks were recently moving, so I went to go collect some garbage out of the uh, my old yeah. room at the house, and I found this book on my old bookshelf, and I grabbed it, and like, this is coming back with me. Oh my god, this book! Um, yeah, I mean, you see how worked up I get just talking. You just about incited it. <laughs> a wave of of fond memories in the comments. I just have to say, oh, yeah. and with up Ryan. here too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm glad that you guys recognize. What say again, Ryan? I cannot tell you how powerful that book is. Isn't it? I mean, I, I, no, you don't. I was going to. Te I'll. I'll come to it later. It, <laughs> it is a major formative piece yeah. of my life. Yeah, in the comments, I actually put up the article that uh, Nicole showed before. I put that up earlier, and I was trying to field comments on my phone at work when I'm not supposed to be on my phone. And a couple of people were like, holy cow, this book, I have an original version uh, that has, I guess it came with like a... Um, with like a, a star chart and like a spec, I, I I could look at the comment. It came with some stuff too, okay. wow. and I yeah, and I don't have that. I don't know. <laughs> I was I, I could have destroyed it as a child possibly. I actually when it was like... just um ordered a copy on Amazon. Did you really? <laughs> awesome. Right now. Can you send us a link? We all need it. I just searched for <laughs> our universe on Amazon, and there's a whole yeah. bunch of used and new options. So uh, yeah, yeah. I, link yeah. Link I put a we'll link see. in my article too. Oh good, good, uh, good. good. So people could buy it. Yeah. Um, but it came with hold on a star chart and a color slide kit. Apparently, Aww, sweet. Uh, according to one of the commenters on yeah. Mad Art Lab, uh, Adela. So thanks for letting me know that. I had no idea um, that I'm missing parts, yeah. and now I have to order <laughs> a new one. Dead. I do actually have to order a new one. I mean, this thing is in so many pieces. It's just yeah. Yeah, like, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, it's things like this that um, can inspire a kid. That can. Uh, anyone who's looking through this, I mean, like, I saw all of your faces light up, especially Ashley and Ryan, <laughs> <laughs> when you're just like, holy cow, I remember that book and, and what kind of a formative experience it had on me, and especially being an artist and like, wow, you can do this? Um, you mm -hmm. can communicate science, and like I didn't even think about it in those terms when I was a kid. Of course, it's like look at these awesome pictures. Look at Mars; he's a warrior, and you know, like, <laughs> it's just <laughs> I don't know. You'll be happy it. to know there's a tie-in in the the um, the uh, the middle school unit we just put together for for Moon Mappers. There's an art tie-in so that the science teacher can work with the art teacher to research different kinds of space art and have the kids make their own space art. And so there's. <gasps> Oh my god. Science teachers are, are thinking about these interdisciplinary awesome. links, which is That's so great. fantastic. I'm really glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, you know, I was encouraged by my parents, and I may have been encouraged by teachers and everything, but putting those things together and having it sort of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, enmeshed in school, like, mm -hmm. here's a program that we're putting you through. I mean, it's so important. Um, yeah. And it, I think that really helps uh, being able to visualize and being able to see 
concepts that can be quite difficult to grasp. I mean, uh, that's so great to hear. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> like, yay, art in school! Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh. That's all I got for awesome. right now, I think. Awesome. Now uh, we've all just yeah. we've all just memory squeed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for demonstrating that enthusiasm that you guys have so well, Brian. Great. Mm. So Ryan, who right. rhymes with Brian and is an actual academic, I believe, or scientist uh -huh. at least, right? Also, also Talk said, to us. All right, I'm not a scientist anymore. I graduated, so now, okay. now I'm a bum. I'm a full -time <laughs> artist. I mean, I am now a full-time artist. Because I just, I just finished my master's. That's accurate. accurate. That's accurate. In engineering, I now have a formal degree in bicycles. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so if ever you need any bicycle science done, Ryan, ask Ryan someone else. I'm so through. sick of it. <laughs> Ryan has come through on several things. Where I'm like, internet, make it happen, and and like the uh, Werner von Braun all the way down. Oh, that oh was I love that, Ryan, by the way. Share. Thank you. Yeah. That, that... Amy Shira titles, cosmology. <laughs> <There it is>. <laughs> <laughs> and you just came up with this. <laughs> like... I didn't come up with it. I simply illustrated. This you is illustrated. why scientists and artists need to get together, because yeah. scientists have brilliant ideas, but in order to communicate, you need visual. You need good, strong visuals to get them through to other people. And that makes and, and that's this is a that strong collaboration. Is now we know what holds the space shuttle up. Porter <laughs> Von Braun. Can you explain that a little bit in more detail, Ryan, for those of us that don't know what you're talking about? Is that well, talking there? Explain. Ver, ver, Werner Von Braun. Well, Werner yeah. Von Braun is um, one of the former Nazi scientists that was brought over and put America into space. He is like. You, you put a list of rocket scientists that are important, he's at the top. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Nicole, is there anyone that goes above him in, like... In the U.S., no. All right. I think. Um, I, you know, really, the Apollo program um, was, was largely... Uh, and this is more of a question for, for Amy Shearer Title, who's our, our space historian extraordinaire, uh, who came up with this idea. But, um, yeah, there was a lot of how much of the U.S. space program was built on Von Braun. And, and that's where the Von Braun's all the way down. <laughs> yes, and, and due to 24 hours of delirium, uh, um, <laughs> Nicole talking to Amy, we came up, they, they came up with the new cosmology that it's just Werner Von Braun all the way down, which is a riff on, it's turtles all the way down, which right. if you don't know about turtles all the way down, look it up, it's brilliant. Yeah, let's go to Terry Pratchett. So yeah, uh, or come just... to our Science of British Sci-Fi panel at Convergence. Yeah. Absolutely. Come that, that, up. <laughs> I can't imagine why. Yeah. Are you going to be dressed as Von Braun, Ryan? Uh, <gasps> for that one? Well, for the British science, I'm probably going to be dressed as uh, David Tennant. Because obviously, Doctor look, Who. people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah let's say. Yeah. The thing that, um, that, that Ryan neglected to mention when going through his Mad Art Lab bona fides was the... Costume and yes. armor making. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, well, was... and wearing. Yes. Well, <laughs> and the gender gonna... norms exploring and. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be yeah. a convergence too. Yes. If you haven't seen, wait, family friendly. Don't look it up. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think it's covered. It's covered. It's, <laughs> it's true. Right. It, it, I think, and I think most of the Google searches bring you to safe places. Uh, so yeah, my my slave Leo, slave uh, Star Wars Princess Leia costume is. Famous! Way more famous than I was expecting it to be. <laughs> but you just weren't thinking about it carefully enough. <laughs> really you not. didn't realize that there was a market for that. There was a market for I that did, idea. I, there, I occasionally get very strange looks in places that are totally unrelated to anything of people going, Hey, uh, 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 I'm very Canadian. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll also be going as Carl Sagan. Very Ooh. exciting. Very exciting. What color is your turtleneck going to be? It's red. Yes. Oh. It's the red turtleneck and the, the beige jacket. Um, where was I going? I got totally sidetracked. <laughs> I turned to talk. I'm just. You're going to well, talk okay, about your you armoring. Well, you've got something behind yeah, you. I do have right? something behind me. I have one of my dragons behind me. Um, tell, us about, tell us about the dragons. So I, I will. Now that. Brian's brought up this book, I will tell you the story of how these dragons have started. So, when I was a kid, there were a couple of things that inspired me to think of the world differently. And they were both brought to me by my father, 
not thrust upon me, just sort of left out for me to explore. And he passed away a couple years ago, so Brian bringing up that book nearly made me cry on screen. <laughs> Damn you! <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Pulling in my heartstrings. Um, but one of them was that book and the aliens within it and the stories of them and the, the reasoning out how they could be and why they would be the way they are. And that exactly. evolution was just... I loved it. And that made me fall in love with astronomy and aliens and biology and evolution all at the same time. And at the same time, there's this device that my father had, which was an antique that he picked up at an auction because it was brilliant, called a, um, a, a Branson Violet Ray Generator. And it is complete snake oil. It's just basically a static electricity maker um, <laughs> that could heal anything. <laughs> and the instruction I'll take five. <laughs> Twelve. Uh, I'll buy them all. Sorry. Yes, it, it, I, I will bring it to Convergence. It is yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, bring it. But putting those together made me, one, fall in love with all these things, but at the same time start questioning them all. And it got me really excited about science. So I'm like, I want to be a scientist. And a few years later, uh, I realized I don't actually want to be a scientist. I'm actually an artist who loves science so much that I accidentally spent ten years <laughs> in <laughs> technical education. Uh, <laughs> it happens. It's cool. Yeah, it's, it was an accident. <laughs> but now I've, I've taken, I'm taking all that and I'm trying to take the things that I loved about that, the art that made me excited, just like these are fun things to look at, but you can learn so much from them and throw them back at the world. So what I do now, my big vent right now, is I make dragon skeletons uh, out of my dinner mostly. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, I, I guess I, I can grab it. I don't. Do you have pictures? Uh, I just shared the blog post. Hang on, I can. Okay. Oh, um, uh, yeah. Here we go. I can share these. Great sharing. But they're lots of fun because you look at them and go. Like my favorite question is, I carry them around sometimes and bring them from place to place, and somebody goes, "Is that real?" <laughs> <laughs> and like the first time I had somebody asked, I was like, "What? What is wrong with you?" No, it's not real. No such thing as dread. But that was just... Then I realized that a lot of people don't have a reason not to believe in dragons. And there's so much of a conversation you can have with that question. Because everybody wants them to be real. They're neat. They're amazing. They, yes. And they appeal to children and grown-ups and nerds. And you go, oh my god, is that real? Or I wish that was real. And then you can talk about why they're not real and why how they could be real and how they can't be. Um, most of my dragons have six limbs, which no vertebrate has. Um, and you, you can talk know about of. that. <laughs> <laughs> on this planet. On, We've got Elizabeth did a blog post on dragons, didn't she? The plausibility yes, right. of dragons, I think. It was. Yep. Yeah. Biological yep. implausibility of dragons. <laughs> Just got yep. that one too. She's a scientist too, right? She's isn't she, she a geneticist? Oh, yeah. Elizabeth, yeah. Elizabeth will be um, defending for her her PhD in October Ooh. in oh genetics. My God. So yeah. she'll she's be another contributor on the doctor. She, she she is more of a scientist than me. Uh, I'm uh, I'm more engineering science. No she, qualifying she doctor. Yeah, yes, that's right. <laughs> Just own it, Ryan. Ryan. <laughs> here's the here's the. Oh, yeah. there, oh, there it is. There, there, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a good photo. And I just and I love making these and talking to people about them because it gets people excited about the thing, which you can then very subtly shift into being excited about science behind the thing. And it's subversive, but at the same time brilliant. Well, excuse me as I pat myself on the back. And like, <laughs> but I love things like this and just things that pull people in, so then you can have a conversation. Yes. Awesome. And yes, I also make armor, but I, that's <laughs> not very sciencey. That's just a thing I do because it's fun and awesome. Well, um, I'm sure, but there's some. There's got to be some science involved in in. It's the true, armor, actually. The skull that um. So during the Cosmo Quest, uh, Cosmothon, 24-hour delirium, um, I don't have any money to contribute, but I said, well, I've got. I can contribute armor, and I think somebody anyone. went, yes, I, yeah. I will. I will buy your armor. And I had this skull, which was going to be a pauldron. 
Um, and what makes me crazy is that the various processes of the skull aren't accurate on it. Mm. This is what the skeptical and scientific community has done to me. Is my artistic rendition of a skull in sheet metal? I, it's, I'm annoyed because <laughs> if the rendition process is, it's not, it's not a proportion. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It's not in my house anymore. I don't have to look at it. Oh, so there we go. That it doesn't fine. bother me. Now somebody else can be happy because they Step don't. Step at Ace House. <laughs> yeah, they don't know or care. <laughs> uh, I want to share. I want to share one more image uh, from Rob Kroll. He, this is a book from the uh, illustration from 1970, an imagined moon base. Um, so let me screen share this once it gets up. In the, uh, of course, this is back when we thought we'd actually be going right back to the moon. Oh, wow. Nice. <laughs> um, is, is a, a hypothetical moon base uh, oh, that's by so Rob cool. Kroll from one of the books he has on his shelf right now. That's oh, and look great. at that. It says, like, from 1980 to 1990 at the wow. top. Is that what it says? Like, this is what we'll be doing. I can't that's read. Not... Yeah, no, I think you're right. Oh, that's uh, depressing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's in well, Polish, I think. Um, not really. I, I'm happier that we sent robots to the Mars than more people to the moon. Is Robots are cool, but I still want to go it's, places. Yeah, I want to go to the moon. It's like a romantic idea, I think. But I, I want to go to the moon. I, I feel like it's romantic until you get there, and then it's yeah. dark and cold, and you're in cold. like, and you have to walk around in a balloon. So <laughs> humanity's been looking up at that little rock for you know some, as long as we've been here. I want to go touch it. Can I actually share? Because I know we're getting close to the end, but but just based yeah. on this like little exchange that just happened. Um, uh, there was an, an interview on Science Friday on NPR last uh, last week with E.O. Wilson, um, who just wrote a book called um, Letters to a Young Scientist about inspiring young people um, to, to go into the sciences. And he says some really great things that are on topic for this group of people, um, one of which is that the ideal scientist should think like a poet. <laughs> Nice. And the the full line is think like a poet and work like a bookkeeper. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but what what he says here this is a quote from from this interview um, is that I've always felt that scientists fantasize and dream and bring up metaphor and fantastic images much as any poet does as anyone in the creative arts. The difference is that at some point the scientist has to re relate the dreams to the real world, mm -hmm. and that's where the booker bookkeeper part comes in. But I think that. Um, that, that that can be true for art as well, um, and that, totally. that, that the point here is that it's that imagination um, and dreaming that's really important. So we can worry later about the, the physical realities of what it's going to be like on the moon. <laughs> it's going to get boring, but you need someone to hope for it. <laughs> yeah, and the creativity and think about how you can in get there just first. designing an experiment. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes dealing with, uh, I've had to deal with image data analysis that's more art than science sometimes. Um, it's, it's, it's learning the, the way it comes together. Um, even though yeah. I was never, ha I, I said I was never an artist, never had any creativity, you have to have that in science too. And I think there's a terrible mistake that I fell victim to, is that we have a lot in our society where you're, you're everyone's a specialist, and you're an artist or a scientist. Right. And... Nobody, I don't think a lot of adults actually believe that's true, but that gets kind of thrown at you when you're a kid. What are you going to be? Are you going to be this or that or that or that? And you end up not realizing that you, you can put ands between all of those. Like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to be a scientist and a mathematician and an artist and, and, and an astronaut. It will be all of this. <laughs> right, yeah. And I would, I would um, say that I would actually argue with E.O. Wilson, not necessarily argue with them, but um, I would say that artists have to be exactly the same thing, poet and bookkeeper. There's just as much really intense, oh non-artistic <laughs> stuff that goes into yeah. being an artist. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, we're, we're more alike than, than you think. Yes. Yeah. Maybe yeah, he'd agree time. with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, so. that divide can go away, I think. Um, and I hope that we're doing our job um, so. in helping sort of erase or blur that line a little bit. Um, yeah, I know. I've heard Amy. You've talked in in panels at conferences before about the analytical thinking that has to go into making art as well. It's not just oh, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> yeah, it can be that. Yeah. But you can start you know, there, like, but so does science. You can exactly, right. exactly. Like that's the that's the starting point, and then 
sort of going into how to make something happen. How do I do this? You still have to understand perspective in order to draw something so that visually it looks realistic to a viewer on a two-dimensional, you mm -hmm. know, flat painting. And then I also think that pretty much all artists need to get a business degree as well as an art degree. Yes. Oh, yes. I think that there's too much just sort of willy-nilly, like, be creative, and that's fantastic, but then there also has rent. to be. You gotta pay yeah. rent. We need our artists to be successful, yeah. so that they yeah. can continue to make art and be respected in our community. So, we need, and then science, you know, because there's so much inspiration in science. So, I would say, give yourself a business degree, an art degree, and a science degree. <laughs> I'm getting my uh, MBA uh, right now. Well, wow. Yeah, or just hang out with us. And yeah, make friends yeah, with scientists you could do that. and artists and. I think, I think it's safe to say this is the most fun place on the internet, is Mad Art Lab. Aww. <laughs> Thank Aww. you. <laughs> Full of happiness. Yeah. And I think that's pretty much all we brought today, but I want to thank everybody for showing the world how awesome you are. Because I know this. And now you guys brought your A-game, and I really appreciate yeah. it. And, and everyone out there listening or watching in the future, please go to madartlab.com. It's a really fantastic community and really wonderful people and great commenters. I mean, it's like this, it's really true that it's like this happy, inspired little spot on the internet that I will have to cry out of my cold, dead hands when I die <laughs> because I love Mad Art Lab and you'll always be able to find us there. Yeah. There's a couple of comments. Uh, Zarin9000 says, Be all the things. <laughs> Michael, exactly. <laughs> Michael Jobin says the passion here is wonderful. So I think that's that's echoing what you're saying is that you guys definitely brought all the awesome today. Thank you so much, Nicole, for having us. It's Thank awesome. you guys for coming. This was fantastic. This was Thank really, you. really, really fun. I love hanging out with you guys. I wish I could have <laughs> with you. Well we'll see I'm... you in what most of us will see you in what? Like yeah. a week. Yeah, yeah, we'll see each other in a week. Ooh. Nicole's my roommate, you guys. Oh, oh yeah. 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 yeah, Brian, where are you? <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. New York City doesn't let you leave once you're in. Uh, well, I, I, well, Staten Island doesn't really count. Hey, I, I, I'm hitching up my sled dogs and coming down. What's your excuse? <laughs> Yay. Um, yeah, so if you're anywhere in the Minneapolis area next week or week yeah. and a half from now. July 4th. July 4th, 4th, 4th through 7th. 10th. Yeah. <laughs> That's Convergence. Uh, it's going to be, it's my first Convergence, so I'm going to be excited. Um, There's a science track that we organized al along with Skeptic and Free Thought Blogs, and it's really great. It's a lot of fun. We have a party room every night, lots of art, lots of science, and lots of geek culture, and it's going to be a lot of fun, and we're all dressing up. And if you're anywhere near the area, please come. It's really an affordable conference. It's a lot of fun. I'm excited. What is that? What is that? <laughs> ah! Oh, man. Uh -oh, awesome. We are going to be so similar in our hats. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I need Different to work characters. on this costume thing. I'm so Some not hats. ready. <laughs> well, you, you can borrow my Slave Leo costume, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little... I need some extra attachments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome, you guys. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you, Nicole. It's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Madartlab.com. That's where you can find uh, all of this, this fun enthusiasm and, and the intersection of art and science and skepticism. Uh, so please go check out the website, and uh, thank you guys for watching Learning Space this week. Um, what do we have? I think uh, the Planetary Society Hangout's usually on Thursday, so check for that tomorrow. Uh, Weekly Space Hangout with Fraser Kane is on Friday. I will probably be gone again this week as we are doing more stuff around here. Um, and then Virtual Star Party is Sunday. Astronomy Cast is Monday. Next week we will be starting a pre-recorded video series for Learning Space because Pamela and I are traveling and can't do live broadcasts. But I will be using my glass to do some science experiments and be sharing those videos. Awesome. Wow, so cool. uh, look for that uh, and we'll resume the live shows um, in about a month from now. So thank you guys so much from Mad Art Lab thank for joining you. us. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> Thanks everybody Bye, for everybody. watching. Bye. Bye. Bye.